Our next speaker is uh, Sebi Choba from the University of Delaware, and he's going to talk about some problems related to eigenvalues of graphs. All right, thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming to my talk. So I will talk uh, about some problem, obviously, related to eigenvalues of graphs. And uh, when Chris asked me to, to give a talk at the workshop, uh, I looked at the topics and I said, I don't have EKR, I don't have quantum, I don't have equiangular lines. And he still uh, wanted me to, to, to give a talk, uh, you know, to, to, to break maybe some of these uh, su subjects for a little bit. So uh, I will tell you about some questions that I don't know how to solve. And, you know, in many talks, uh, people, uh, you know, pretend to be tired and so on and stressed. And they say, you know, these are the problems that, uh, you know, keep me up at night, they're so difficult, you know, the lambda of j of this, lambda two of this, lambda mean of this, what they are. Well, I'm not gonna lie to you about what keeps me up at night. Uh, these are some things that keep me up at night. So my kids recently have gotten a uh, 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 Syrian hamster, that's Humphrey on the left. And as soon as they go to bed and the night uh, falls, he starts running on that, uh, on that uh, wheel, so he's a very uh, he's very uh, active during the during the night, very dedicated. Plus, we got leopard geckos. These ones are much uh, much quieter than uh, than the uh, than the hamster. So yeah, joking aside, I'll talk about eigenvalues of graphs, and uh, I will focus on the on the eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix. As everybody know, here knows. If you have a graph on n vertices, you can associate an adjacency matrix where the rows and columns are indexed by the vertices of the graph. And in the entry corresponding to the row X and column Y, you put the number of edges between X and Y. And because the graph is, uh, is undirected, uh, this matrix is, uh, is symmetric. And, and uh, its, uh, its eigenvalues are, are real. And I'll denote it by lambda one, lambda two, lambda min. So for this uh, friendship graph or bow tie graph with two triangles sharing a vertex, that's an adjacency matrix, and those are the those are the eigenvalues. Um, I will mostly focus on regular graphs. So for regular graphs, you get some things for free. So if the graph is connected and deregular, then uh, the largest eigenvalue is d, and it has a multiplicity uh, one, and all the eigenvalues are between minus d and d. And you have this property that the graph is bipartite if and only if the smallest eigenvalue is, is minus D, in which case the whole spectrum is symmetric with respect to, with respect to zero. And uh, so the eigenvalues that I'll, that I'll focus on will be uh, lambda two. And as you well know, lambda two is uh, the spectral gap between D and lambda two, D minus lambda two uh, in the case of, uh, it's, it's also known as uh, the algebraic connectivity of, uh, you know, introduced study by Fiedler for general graphs, not just, not just regular. And it also is related to this expansion constant of, uh, of the graphs. And it's, it's very important in the study of, uh, of expander graphs, which are these sparse and highly connected graphs. And for uh, lambda mean, as again, uh, many people have talked about and are, are experts in this uh, subject, a lambda mean is related, uh, closely related to the independence number, chromatic number, and uh, I'm not sure if it appeared in the talk, but also to the max cut and to the kind of bipartiteness of the graph. Um, there's uh, from the second result there, having the graph bipartite, if and only if lambda mean equals minus D, one can think of this, uh, this uh, measure of uh, how bipartite of the graph is this gap between lambda min and, and minus d. So we'll see that in, in a little bit. So this is kind of just the informal view about this, uh, this, uh, these eigenvalues and kind of what, uh, what they relate to. So let me give you a first problem. So it's related to K1, K3 graphs. So to, to the result, first result is below that, but to, to state it, I just need to give you a notation. So for d greater or equal to k, k greater or equal to, uh, to, to three, uh, TDK is kind of like the complementary Turan number. So it's the minimum number of, uh, of edges in a graph on D vertices, 
with independence number uh, k minus one or less. So if you think about it in terms of the complement, it's uh, it should be n choose two minus the my, uh, maximum number of edges in a graph with clique number k minus one or less. So stated in this form, this TDK is attained by uh, by this graph in which you you split the vertices into um, one two k minus one uh, clicks, each of size d over k minus one. And that's the graph, that's the smallest number of edges in, uh, that's, that's what uh, TDK is, is gonna be the number of edges in, in this graph. So you have no edges between, between these purple clicks and you have all the edges inside them. So therefore TDK is roughly k minus one uh, times uh, the number of edges in each of these clicks, which is about d squared over two k minus one. And in 2016, uh, Aharoni, Alon, and Berger, uh, they have a paper in a journal of graph theory in which they prove this bound. They prove a more general bound, which is for the largest eigenvalue of the Laplacian matrix for a general graph. It doesn't have to be regular. But if you translate their result for regular graph, it says that if you have, again, all my graphs will be connected. So if you have a connected irregular graph that contains no induced K1K, then uh, D plus lambda mean this, this uh, gap moves away from zero. That's kind of how you should see this. And what's again, like kind of the high level view is that if you do not have a, an induced K1K, then on the neighborhood, on the subgraph induced by the neighborhood of each, of each vertex, the independence number is gonna be uh, K minus one or less. And therefore on that neighborhood, you're gonna see at least TDK number of edges. So the neighborhood is gonna be, of each vertex is gonna be dense. And therefore, if you have a neighborhood of each vertex being dense, many triangles, intuitively speak, you know, uh, yeah, uh, the graph is far from bipartite. So D plus lambda mean should, should move away from zero. And they prove this, this lower bound, TDK divided by D minus one. Okay. Now that's their bound. I just restate it over there on the top. Uh, in the same paper, they prove, uh, uh, they give examples of, uh, of uh, the regular graph with no induced K1K in which, so this lambda N here should be lambda min. Uh, so in which lambda min uh, is, is, is small, in which, you know, D, la, D plus lambda min is maybe, you know, um, is, uh, is, um, close to, to whatever bound, to the bound that they found. So their construction is the following. You take a bipartite uh, K minus one regular graph um, and you blow, uh, you blow up each vertex into a, into a clique of, of, uh, of size, uh, size S. I'll give the picture for the case K equals uh, three on the next page. And uh, so the resulting graph, it's gonna be D regular with, uh, with D equals K S minus one. And it has no, uh, it doesn't have any, any induced K1K. And you can actually calculate the, uh, you can use the eigenvector from, from the original graph, one in, on one side and minus one on the other side. And you can calculate uh, the lambda mean and you get this D plus lambda mean being about uh, 2S minus one, which is about 2DK. So you see the, this is the, these are the best examples that, uh, uh, are known. And again, uh, this example are for the degree of regularity of this form, Ks minus one. So it's not every, every degree has necessarily that, that form. And you see there is a gap between the, the bounds that they prove, which is about uh, d over 2k minus one and the, the construction, which is 2d over k. So let's kind of focus on the first case, which would be like claw free. So claw free, it's the same thing as uh, K133, again, induced, no, no induced K, K13. And uh, so their construction in this case is to take, um, you know, you take a, a cycle, an even cycle, and you, you blow up every, uh, every edge into a KS. So perhaps the simplest one you, you blow up each of these vertices into a K2. And then you, 
you just add all the all the edges between them. I'm not going to draw all of them because it becomes a bit of a mess. So you see, okay. And then again, the their lower bound uh, here is about uh, is about uh, d over four, uh, and the the best construction that they they could come up with uh, in this situation is uh, is this one. Uh, so you take this even cycle and you blow them up with uh, with with, uh, with cliques. Um, I mean, it's pretty. It's it's not too hard to to show that these graphs are clove free, because the neighborhood of each vertex, the neighborhood of each vertex is going to be uh, essentially a union of two cliques, of two large cliques. So the best you can do for an independence number is to take a vertex from 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 each of the cliques on this side. And like I said, the lambda min calculation, it's, it's fairly easy by, by taking an eigenvector here to minus one, minus one, minus one, and putting here one, 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 and you can, uh, you can get this, uh, this calculation. And so this is the first, uh, so uh, the, uh, I, um, this is the first problem that, I mean, I, I thought about it for, for a while and I, I still don't know how to, I don't know how to solve. Um, and they put it as an open problem in their paper as well to close the gaps between uh, between the bounds that they have and 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 these examples. Again, their construction. So one thing would be to to try to you know um, I'll talk a little bit about the proof and I I think the uh, for their lower bound which I think it should be uh, should be improved. I don't think it's it's tight, but also their constructions work only in this uh, in this range so of d equals three s minus one. So for if you want claw free. You're just starting with five regular, you know, uh, graph and, and so on, eight regular and so on. So, for other degrees, what what other constructions can you can you find? And uh, we did a little bit. Uh, so this is a, a small, a tiny improvement uh, in the special case of cubic graphs because if you're cubic and claw free, you know that your neighborhoods are either like this or like this. Um, sorry. And then uh, you can play around. It's it's fairly. You can play around with eigenvectors and so on. And you can. We have this paper. I work on similar problem related problems with David Gregory a long time ago, and then with uh, uh, Randy and so on. And we wrote. Uh, I wrote something, and uh, you know they're co-authors, even though yeah, David uh, passed away a while ago. And this was in the special volume for Simic uh, by Discussion in Mathematica and Graph Theory. And you can improve a little bit from uh, from 2.5. You can you can play with eigenvectors. You can get it a little bit higher. This number it's approximation of a root of a, of a cubic, and it gets closer. But I I feel like the the extremal example should be something like like this, like uh, one of these uh, collection of uh, diamonds that that uh, keeps go goes on and on and on, and loops back around. But I, I haven't been able to, to to prove it. There are similar questions. So this type of uh, struct, kind of like this uh, this uh, path cycle like structure, it's more like a path like structure, appears in the in some some uh, problems studied by uh, Guiduli and Imrik, where they looked at the uh, at the cubic graphs that minimize the spectral gap between the first and the second eigenvalue. And uh, but I don't think the I don't think the problems are are, are related necessarily. Um, okay, so come back to the proof. So this is what they what they do. Uh, actually, their proof doesn't use this hypothesis. Like containing no induced k one k, it's pretty it's 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 a strong hypothesis. Uh, it implies. It implies that uh, the the number of edges in each neighborhood of X is greater or equal than uh, than T D K, but it's not equivalent to it. It's it's not the same thing. It you know this is the same thing as the independence number of every of every neighborhood being at most K, and that implies that the number of edges by Turan theorem is at least that much. But uh, the implication uh, backwards is is not true. Just because you you have many edges, it doesn't mean that your independence number is is necessarily small. And so in their proof, they this is what they use the 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 
claw freeness or K1K freeness is not used. So I don't know if there's a way, at least maybe for, for claw free, to, to use some of these uh, structural results that uh, uh, people in, uh, in other parts of graph theory have, have obtained. I, I haven't been able to, uh, to do that. Um, so that's one remark about, about uh, this. And essentially what they prove is, and I have a, like a small generalization of it, you can generalize it in the following sense. You have a small graph, a K, which is K regular and a big graph G, and we're trying to lower bound this uh, D plus lambda mean for the G. Well, if, if there is a, some collection of uh, subgraphs of G, which are isomorphic to K, such that two conditions you have to have. Each vertex is contained in at least M, if each vertex of the big graph is contained in at least uh, M copies of K, and each edge of, of G is contained in at most T copies of K, then you can use the smaller graph to get yourself a, a lower bound for the, for, the, for, the bigger, for the bigger graph, D plus lambda mean. And I'll give you the proof on the next slide. It's, it's actually very simple. In the case of uh, uh, Haroni, Alon, and Berger, essentially the K is K3. And uh, because uh, you have this uh, condition of K, you know, each, each neighborhood, in each neighborhood, you have at least T, D, K uh, uh, edges, that takes place of the M. Uh, K plus lambda mean of K, if I have done my math right, uh, K is K3, so it's two regular and lambda mean is minus one, so it gives you one. So that becomes one here. You have the M taking the place there. And then the T is that uh, each edge, well, if you are in a D regular graph and you take an edge, what's the largest number of, I mean, this bound is also can be improved because clearly the largest maximum number of triangles that you can be in is D minus one because you already used one of your edges here. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's a proof. So we should know that there is a very nice paper by Knox and Mohar in which they use, uh, it, they proved similar bounds for uh, D plus lambda mean uh, using like a fractional decomposition. So it, you can use several graphs, not the same copy of the same graph, and you can, you can kind of weight them uh, such that uh, the sum of the weights at each vertex is the same. And then you can get a, a lower bound on this, uh, on this D plus lambda mean parameter. And they use it to give some simpler proof of some results of Jacques Coulon and his co-authors about smallest eigenvalues of uh, distance regular graphs. So it's a very nice, uh, very nice paper. So let me give you the proof now. So here's the proof, it's like three lines. So again, you have these conditions that each vertex is containing the least M copies and each edge is containing at most K, T copies. So I start with the T. So I have the T here. So I, I have, I take an unit eigenvector for, for, uh, for lambda mean. Then uh, if I write, because X is unit, D plus lambda mean equals this summation here. That's, that's pretty easy. And now each edge in the graph is contained in the most T copies of, of K. So this T upper bounds the number of uh, times that this Xi plus Xj square appears on the right-hand side. Summation over all subgraphs in this collection K over this Ij in the edge set of, this should be, this should be H. But here, this one, all the subgraphs H are isomorphic to K. And again, by this uh, Rayleigh ratio, this vector is, is anything. So this uh, summation of Xi plus Xj square is greater or equal than, than, than K plus lambda mean of K times the sum of the squares of the eigenvectors. And now you take K plus lambda mean K as a factor. And the second part comes into place that each of these X, X, XL uh, squares is gonna appear at least M times. So that's why it, it pops in there. So the, the condition two is used here and the condition one is used at the end. And that's, that's basically it. So yeah, I mean, it would be nice to, I mean, I don't know how strong this is. I'll show you an example in which it gives you something, but it maybe doesn't give you as much as you want. So 
in, you know, it might be worth uh, trying to to see, depending on the situation, if some, uh, you know, if more can be done with this with this type of argument. So I, I talked a little bit about this last time when I gave a talk about a year ago in, in Waterloo, but I'll mention it again because I still haven't solved the problem. So hopefully uh, uh, some other people can can chime in. So I apply this, uh, this argument for the smallest eigenvalue of the associahedron graph. So associahedron graph has been studied by uh, various names, Tamari Lattice, Dashe, Polytop, and so on. So here, what you have, you take all the triangulations of a convex n-gon. So here in the picture, I have n equals six. And you, in the graph, you make two of them adjacent uh, if they differ by uh, the flip of a, if they differ in exactly one, uh, uh, one diagonal. So it's kind of like a Johnson graph of the, of the set of diagonals. Basically, the, in this picture, the intersection between uh, the, like if you have any edge, uh, the, uh, the two triangulations at, as the endpoints, they overlap in exactly two diagonals. So, and uh, this, this graph has a realization as this polytop in dimension n minus three. I think several people proved this. And that's n equals six drawn in, in R3. And uh, various parameters of this graph have been studied. So there's this paper by Slator, Tarjan, and Thorsten, in which they have a very nice proof that the diameter is at most uh, 2n minus 10. It's a combinatorial proof. It's just uh, very, very simple. How many, how many uh, diagonal flips can get you from one, uh, from one triangulation to another triangulation? And they prove it's always at most 2n minus 10. And they conjecture that this is the diameter. And this was a big result. It was proved by Pournan. It's in Advances of Math in 2014. And he showed that that's the case for n greater than, than 12. Um, these other authors, they studied uh, the chromatic number. So they were doing, I mean, these flip graphs, this is an example of a flip graph, the, you know, the flip graphs on perfect matchings and so on, on many objects. And these are quite, uh, interesting combinatorially and also you'll see from a probabilistic point of view because people can uh, do random walks on this uh, on this graph to try to generate things uh, you know a triangulation at random for example but this uh, paper had, had looked at uh, various uh, flip graphs and they were interested in chromatic numbers and so they had two conjectures uh, one that the chromatic number of the associahedron goes to infinity as n goes to infinity and second that it grows slowly. And they said, well, we put a big O of log, of log N because that's the first function we thought that goes to infinity relatively uh, slowly. Um, and so this conjecture, so the second conjecture is proved by, there is a paper on archive by uh, uh, Adario Berry, uh, Bruce Reed, Alex Scott, and David Wood in which they, they prove that uh, you can color it with something times log n colors, properly color. And for the second one, I don't know what the, they didn't discuss much of the evidence, but I'm guessing that it was the fact that this chromatic number stayed uh, uh, put at three from n equals five to nine, and then it made this uh, jump at uh, four. So A10 has about 1,400 vertices because it's our, these are the triangulations of a, of a, of a 10 gone. So it's the Catalan number for, for that value. And it's uh, quite large, but it's a sparse graph. And so in this case, this is all done by computer. They put it in their paper. We, we also uh, check them. And then the computation, we have no idea what happens afterwards, chromatic number of uh, 11 and so on. And so as you well know, you, you have these bounds on, uh, chromatic numbers using eigenvalues. So, okay, you know, Hoffman ratio gives you this bound. What can you say? The, the degree of regularity of this graph is n minus three because each triangulation of an n-gon has n minus three diagonals. So you can flip each one of them. So what can you say about the smallest eigenvalue of this graph? Now this graph, it's, it's, it's a pretty graph, but it's not, a, it's not a very symmetric graph because if you think for a second, the triangulations as n gets large, they, they don't all look the same, okay? So it's actually a result, I think, of, uh, of uh, Moon and Moser in which they use Mobius inversion and they calculated the, you know, they, 
think they, the um, um, the automorphism group is a dihedral group, and they show that the the, the number of uh, orbits is like exponential in n. So this graph is exponentially many vertices and so on, and it's not very symmetric. So what can you do with the eigenvalue? And so that's how I came up into this. Uh, you know, kind of, I was looking at the paper by Aharoni, Alon, and Berger, and this, and this is the best I could do to find a lower bound for the smallest eigenvalue. And you can prove uh, that in AN, each vertex is going to be in, uh, in at least so many, so here N equals six. So each vertex is in at least two cycles C5. Each edge is in at most four cycles C5. And using the previous bound with a, so I'm, I'm going to use now as, uh, as these subgraphs K that, uh, that live inside my big graph, I'm going to use the cycle C5. You end up with this, uh, with this, this kind of bound. And uh, yeah, that number there minus something is, uh, puts this lambda mean strictly above minus, minus N over three. Um, I mean, there could be a way to, to do it better because here I have at least, and here I have at most. Uh, it's not like every vertex is in exactly n minus four, and every vertex is in exact it is in exactly uh, uh, four cycle. One of these bounds, I think you can uh, do. Um, uh, they can be improved, but I don't know how to how to do to improve the bounds. And so, what I did is so from the from this argument with the, uh, that I showed on the previous slide, you can get something like this. You can move the lambda mean away from the degree by some, some positive constant. And then if I want to find an upper bound, then uh, we, you can calculate these eigenvalues for, for up to n equals 12, you get to here. And then uh, I use eigenvalue interlacing because if I, if I take a, a big, uh, if I take a big n gone, and I fix a diagonal, I look at the subgraph uh, consisting of all the triangulations that have a fixed diagonal, then the adjacency can only happen here or can happen here. I cannot cross the diagonal because it's, it's fixed. So you can prove that uh, there is uh, the subgraph induced by this, uh, by these vertices that fix a diagonal is some kind of, it's a box product of, uh, of two, smaller, two smaller associahedron graphs. And you can get some inequality like I wrote there. And then uh, Fekete's lemma tells you that this limit of uh, lambda min over n, or in this case, I put in n minus three because it's the degree, it exists. And this, you know, you can do uh, like a induction proof pretty much uh, by uh, to, to get this this bound here on the top, just using just peeling off every time, like um, you know, one part of it you put an a twelve, and you know you you continue uh, to do that, and this is the best I can I can come up with like this limit between. So in the end, uh, this was unsuccessful for the for the chromatic number. It doesn't give you anything because this uh, lambda mean is not going to behave like little o of n. It's actually linear in this n minus three and uh, but I don't know what the, what the limit is yeah um, then when I looked at this uh, I started talking to people I actually the last workshop that I traveled to was uh, at MSRI um, we we're one of the academic sponsors and they have a very nice uh, meeting every every March at MSRI and uh, their Simon Institute there are many smart people so I was talking with uh, uh, Presa Tetali about these problems, and he was telling me about uh, he told me about three or four random walks that you can do on on these triangulations, and he said, oh yeah, this one is related to this conjecture of Aldous about the second eigenvalue, and so apparently there is a conjecture of Aldous about the number of steps to uh, you know to do a random walk to to converge to the uniform distribution. And it's conjecture that the number of steps is about like n to the power three three halves. And if you translate that to eigenvalues, it's something like the gap, the spectral gap between uh, of of the associahedron graph is about uh, one over root n. Now there are these bounds 
for the spectral gap of uh, of regular graphs, uh, but they're usually you know at least one over the number of vertices times the diameter. And here, the number of vertices is uh, uh, is exponentially known, so you know, one needs to do something. So I wrote an email a while ago to David Aldous asking him about to to uh, dummy down for me. And this is the email that he wrote back. I'm still struggling. I'm trying to understand. Um, uh, this was the proof. So one apparently one part of this conjecture is is known that uh, uh, you can you can. Uh, so let me see how it works. D minus lambda two. I think it's the, the lower bound. I think it's 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 known. And this is his uh, proof. I still I'm I, I'm trying to to understand. Uh, this argument. I have a colleague of mine who is a probabilist, and he's promised me that he will give me the proof as a you put this eigenvector into the adjacency matrix, and you get the gap, you get the uh, you know uh, bound on the gap. But I still haven't gotten. It. Um, okay, so I'll switch now to a different topic. So I'll talk about some Cayley graphs. So again, it's there's this conjecture of Aldous about the Cayley graphs uh, generated by sets of transpositions. And you know this was a big, uh, big result that if you have a set of transposition and um, you can regard this transposition as edges of a graph on uh, on n vertices, then the spectral gap of the Cayley graph of S n with respect to those transposition equals the algebraic connectivity of H. So the algebraic connectivity of H I haven't defined it, but it's the it's the uh, the Second largest uh, eigenvalue of the Laplacian of the Laplacian graph. So some simple examples: if you take all the if you take all the transpositions t1, then you can you know this graph is going to be regular of valency n choose two, and lambda one is n choose two. And uh, I mean this was done before by I think Diaconis and Shashahani. Uh, you can calculate uh, eigenvalues, and lambda two is n choose two minus n, which is n is exactly the 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 spectral gap the the uh, second eigenvalues uh, of the Laplacian of the complete graph, and similarly, if you take uh, the star, I think this was considered by in a paper by Flato or, or Zilko and uh, and Wales in about uh, mid eighties. Again, the Cayley graph um, has this lambda two, and uh, if you take this uh, adjacent uh, transposition, you get what is called the permutahedron. And also, like the eigenvalues have been have been worked out. So a natural question is: Okay, if you take other, uh, uh, you know, can you say something about other lambda two of other Cayley graphs of, of S n? And this is a big topic, so I'm not going to go into, you know, there are these questions of Lubotsky about making S n into expander graphs, and I think those are solved by uh, Kasabov about 10, 15 years ago. So I'll do something. I'll show you what one can do with with bare hands using uh, uh, simple methods, executable partitions, because these graphs are very, uh, very nice structure. So as you all know, I mean, uh, this is uh, I assume everybody is aware of these things. But if you have the graph and a partition of the vertex set, it's called executable. If you have these numbers that depend only on the indices of the classes in the partition such that if you take any vertex in class J and you count the number of neighbors of that vertex in class L, that doesn't depend on the vertex, it just depends on, B, uh, on, on J and L. And you can create this quotient matrix uh, B. And so on the left, there is an equitable partition of, of the Peterson graph. Uh, and on the right, it's a partition of, uh, of Peterson graph that is, not, that is not equitable. So, okay, why people care about this in, uh, Algebraic graph theory. Well, you can use this if you have an equitable partition. Then the eigenvalues of the quotient matrix are actually eigenvalues of the of the big graph, and the, their eigenvectors are going to kind of lift up to eigenvectors of the big graph, and they're going to be constant on those cells of the partition. And you can take the remaining eigenvectors to be orthogonal on the characteristic vectors of uh, of the sets in this uh, equitable partition. So that's kind of a thing that is used. In, in, in many situations to, to get uh, information on the spectrum. Okay, so let me give you an example. So for example, people, uh, so 
I was reading this paper by uh, Chang and Tobin in two, the Electronic Journal of Combinatorics 2017, and they studied these uh, pancake graphs. So pancake, uh, there's a story about flipping pancakes and uh, you can represent the graph as a Cayley graph of uh, SN. So the vertices are the permutations and uh, uh, two of them are adjacent. If they differ by this, uh, they're the same except for the prefix reversal. So you take a, a, a prefix of one and you flip it and you get the other. So clearly the graph is N minus one regular. And the diameter of this graph is still unknown. There's like these bounds, uh, you know, started with uh, Bill Gates work when he was an undergraduate. And uh, Chang and Tobin consider generalized pancake graphs, I guess. It's again, a Cayley graph of SN uh, with the property. So the generating set also has cardinality uh, uh, n minus one, and you don't have to flip the entire uh, first uh, first uh, pre the first segment of length k. You just flip the first entry with the kth entry. So your per your permuta uh, permutation is going to have exactly one neighbor of this form. And so this example in these graphs f n it's clearly more more general. That you can have many families, so includes the pancake graphs, but also includes this graph of uh, Flato, Zilko, and Wales, in which you just swap one and k, and you leave everything uh, the same. But according to this definition by Chang and Tobin, you could have graphs in which you can shuffle those ones in in other words, other ways. Okay, so what did they do? So for the pancake graph, Sessi gave a proof. So this was before the resolution of uh, of uh, of the Aldous conjecture. So he proved that the spectral gap is one. Uh, there was a question asked by, other, by some, some other authors. And then Chang and Tobin, they get, so he used the representation of the symmetric group. Chang and Tobin used this uh, equitable partition business and they also did FN. And so the arguments are pretty much go as you expect them to go. You find a nice partition. In this case, uh, you know, for any J pretty much, you can partition the permutations according to the ones. So xj are the ones where j is at the end. Uh, yj are the ones where, uh, so, so xj will be the one you have star, 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 uh, j. And then uh, yj are the ones you have j, star, star, like this. And here you put zj uh, where the j is, anywhere else, okay? And one can prove that this is a equitable partition. Actually, there's more about the structure. So for example, here, the only way the you have an adjacency here to here, this you're gonna have a perfect matching between these two parts because you have the J, you have to completely flip it. And inside here, you actually have a copy of a smaller Fn minus one because since the J is in the last position, then you have to flip in the first n minus one position. So anyway, you get this, you prove this equitable partition, you get eigenvalues n minus one, the valence n minus two and one. And clearly that implies that lambda two has to be at least n minus two. So from, from this part. And then you have to prove that lambda two is at most n minus one. And so their proof is an induction on n. When n is three, this, pancake graph is C6, so that works, you get one. And then there is a very, it's a very nice proof. I'm not gonna go through the details, but it will take you like maybe, you know, 20 minutes and so on to, to go over it. And they basically take, a, you, you, you use the previous partition into the XJ, uh, YJ and so on. Uh, by the previous uh, uh, argument of equitable partition, you can assume that if you take an eigenvalue eigenvector pair, this, uh, this eigenvector F is gonna sum up to zero here. So it sums up to zero. So F sums to zero, uh, actually in here and in here. And then uh, you write the eigenvalue eigenvector equation. The fact that this graph, this vertex has exactly one neighbor here. The fact that here you see Fn minus one, and you play around with some inequalities and you can prove that mu is at most uh, lambda two of xj plus one. And the lambda two of xj is lambda two of fn minus one, because uh, that's the graph that lives in there. It's kind of like this uh, um, 
the smaller graph lives lives inside there. And then by an induction, that's a minus three, and that that gives you the result. So it worked here. Uh, I have here a slide. Uh, Lambda mean is not so interesting and it's pretty ugly. So you do calculations. I don't know what these numbers are. I have the computation if you're interested. So Lambda mean, I don't think there's anything nice there. Um, but then Chang and Tobin, they looked at reversal graphs and reversal graphs are the ones in which you are adjacent if you, uh, if you differ by this uh, substring reversal. So you, you don't have to be, uh, uh, you don't have to invert a prefix. You can invert any, any, any interval. So clear here that this graph is much, uh, you know, the degree of regularity is n choose two. Again, it's a Cayley graph of some, uh, you know, um, set of permutation. And this is, I mean, it's studied by people in uh, genomics arrangements and so on. So Pesner, he's a, uh, I might have misspelled his name, but they are. Uh, it's it's quite an important. This kind of permit uh, these graphs, reversal graphs, and sign reversal graphs. They appear in this uh, in this uh, biology literature quite a lot, and they figure out the diameter, uh, and then uh, Chang and Tobin they figure out the spectral gap for this uh, for these graphs. And the argument is again is is very similar. So one to get lambda. Um, uh, lambda two of Rn bigger than something. In this case, they have to do a bit of work because the equitable partition that they take are going to be uh, essentially their left cosets of uh, of a stabilizer of the of, of a point, and then you get this partition into n parts, and they prove that this is equitable, and they calculate the eigenvalues of the Cauchy matrix, and uh, they're listed there and you get n, n choose two minus n in uh, you know for, for as a second eigenvalue of the quotient matrix so that takes care of one, for one part and then for the second part again you use induction on n you have now uh, you're going to have this uh, these n parts and they partition uh, you know they take this uh, this eigen you know you have to to show that for any uh, you know, eigenvalue mu, which is uh, non-trivial and so on, with f summing to zero on each on each of these uh, on each of these uh, blobs, you have to show that mu is at most this n choose two minus n. And so what they do is they partition the edge set into the edges in between. And in this case, the edges in between these blobs give them uh, the the previous graph, the the pancake one and the edges inside here, and these edges inside here, they're just copies of the smaller graph. And then uh, it's, they, you need to do some, some clever inequalities, but essentially this is sufficient for them to prove that, uh, to, get, uh, to get the inequality, the inequality that you want. So that works. So they have some questions. Uh, lambda mean, uh, we, again, I, don't know how uh, how nice it is. You, th this is a graph from their paper in which they put the spectrum of R seven. Uh, you can see that there are some. Uh, you know, this is the the degree of regularity, the second eigenvalue, and then there are some horizontal segments. So there are some integer eigenvalues that have high multiplicities, and they have some questions on uh, again this kind of probabilistic view of things, looking at uh, bounding the number of steps to to get close in, in total variation distance from the uh, uniform distribution, they get a bound of something like n log square of n, and they conjecture that it can be proved to n n log n for for this. Uh, this is for the for the fn, and they have similar questions for for rn as well. So we we use these essentially these methods. So we have a paper with uh, q x one and x one. In electronic journal of combinatorics and you can play this game of of having a nice partition of sn into left cosets of uh, stabilizer and you can do some work and you can get some uh, some second eigenvalue so we can we have a list of uh Cayley graphs for which you can find and there are some that for which we cannot somehow i don't i don't understand uh the kind of the i don't have a deeper reason why it, it doesn't work 
And so, for example, like if you take the permutations, the transpositions, the Cayley graph has a certain spectral gap. If you take uh, the cycles of, uh, of length three, uh, you know, the Cayley graph with respect to this is disconnected because they're all, uh, you have even, even permutations. But uh, so lambda one equals lambda two. And we can, as an example, you can use this method to calculate lambda two for these graphs. I don't have a particular application for it, but it, it just works for, for, for these graphs and for some other families of Cayley graph of SN. It doesn't work for lambda mean. Unfortunately, we cannot, like uh, these partitions, when you do these partitions, each of these blobs are relatively dense. So the trace is gonna be large. So that's kind of my, my intuition why you don't get something uh, like a small eigenvalue there. You cannot, you don't catch it. Okay. So now going from reversal graphs, there this notion of sign reversal graphs in which you look at sign permutation. So each entry in the permutation has a plus or minus sign and adjacent. So you have, uh, now you have two times, two to the n more permuta sign permutations and your adjacent, if you reverse uh, uh, an interval, but you also change the sign. So you can prove that this SRN, this is a typo here, SRN has degree n plus one over two because you can also change the sign of a single entry. So this, you see before uh, we had i strictly less than j, here you can have i equals j. That's why this degree is a little bit, uh, uh, it's n more. And so we did this work with Gordon Royal and Zhao Kuang Tan, uh, an undergraduate from Singapore last year. And we're interested in the chromatic number for these graphs. We did, uh, Gordon, we did, Gordon did some computations and we have this, uh, these upper bounds. These graphs grow very fast. So uh, yeah, we like to, I mean, proving, you know, anything like a chi of SRN at most N, that would be nice, but anything, yeah, I, we, I don't have any good uh, upper mark. Uh, we don't know anything independence number of SRN. Yeah, we, we don't have any, any results about them. Um, now, you, if you look at the eigenvalues, you can do various equitable partitions. So one of them is you take all the sign permutations that have a certain support. So the support are the, the permutation and you just ignore the signs and uh, you partition like this is kind of is like a cover and so what you get is you get this partition into n factorial sets and it has a quotient matrix which is essentially the one of the reversal graph plus some uh, uh, identity matrix and you can get a large part of the spectrum that way you can also do another similar partition to the one that uh, Chang and Tobin did and you get in all this, you get n choose two appear in both spectra. And uh, by computation, it also seemed that n choose two is the second largest eigenvalue. Uh, is true for n less than or equal to five. If it was for n greater to five, that would be done. So we, again, the, this is true for n and most five. And clearly because it's in the, these quotient matrices, you know that is greater or equal to n over two. So the argument would be to try to do similar thing with Chang and Tobin did. We tried quite hard last, uh, last summer uh, with uh, my PhD student dear Noel Desai and, uh, and a little bit with Mike Tate, but uh, we haven't been able to, to prove this. So I don't know how to, how to do it. That's again a, a problem. Okay, so in the previous talk, we had a speaker talking about pipe dreams. So I'll tell you one pipe dream, which is you know uh, unrelated to all this stuff. So I don't, um, this is an eigenvalue proof of Hilton mineral theorem, since this is on Erdos Corrado and so on. So that would be a, 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 a nice result. It's not mine. I, I assume many people have, have thought about it and so on. And uh, you know, that's, that's something that would, be, that would be quite nice. And so I will finish here. This is my last slide. Uh, you know, some speakers put elephants and zebras and so on on the, on the last slide. So I'll put uh, uh, our dog. Uh, Jupiter. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for Sebi? Yeah, I ask about the symmetric group, Sebi. Sure. So if you 
And so, so the smallest eigenvalue is difficult because you don't know when you when you combine basis relations and association scheme, you don't know which 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 representation to look at. But for the second largest eigenvalue, if you really restrict the the conjugacy classes to things that move at most five points, for example, doesn't the character table, the symmetric group, give you some leverage over locating the the obvious candidates for the second largest eigenvalue? Yeah, I mean it's possible. We just maybe don't know that much uh, representation theory of the symmetric group, and we try to see how much we can push it with this with this method. So, on this uh, in this paper, we have a list of things that work and a list of things that do not work. So it's you know, um, and yeah, it, it, it's possible that you can do these things uh, differently. We we just didn't know how to to do it. We uh, you know we went this route. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The problem with the representation theory of symmetric group is it doesn't give you the eigenvalues. It gives you algorithms for computing the eigenvalues. And I think it gets very difficult to decide whether one thing is bigger than another. Yeah. So like I said, I, our main motivation was in this paper by Chang and Tobin, things work out so well. Like it's, you know, uh, whatever comes from this uh, quotient matrices, which are e relatively easy to handle, they can also upper bound them on the other side. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, we have a very smart dog. Yeah, this is uh, uh, the one that uh, Bill Marty tried to catch when he visited a few years ago. And uh, I have a video of that, but uh, I'm not going to share it. Uh, yeah. Are you going to share it once we stop recording? Yeah, I can look yeah, in my... Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to share it then. Uh, I think it, I once, have it once. It's, once Bill stops pay, paying him off. Yeah, if, uh, <laughs> yeah once, uh, once Bill falls asleep. Be, there's that. more beer involved if, if you just uh, behave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like the Quebec uh, uh, beer. Uh, the end of but, the world. Yeah, we, Unibrew. Yeah. yeah. It's excellent. Yeah, it's a nice one. Yeah. Sebi, what do you yeah. think the chances are of actually getting an argument that you proved? Uh, I'd say <laughs> I don't know about the chances. I tried, but that doesn't mean anything. Uh, you know, there's smarter people that can do it. I mean, the way I thought about it is to try to set up the, the situation with this independent set that's uh, maximal, but not maximum, whatever, the one for Hilton Milner, to have it uh, set up in some kind of nice equitable partition, like uh, the, the one for the... Um, for the usual independent set, you have the independent set on one side and the other side, and that's a nice partition into two parts is equitable. And I try to have it uh, work it out again, kind of backwards from the extremal example, uh, but I couldn't figure out, like it turned, there were like four parts that appeared there and I kind of uh, gave up, but I don't know, maybe there's this, I don't know, Stuff that well, people do, like uh, Ellis and Friedgood, all this uh, Fourier stuff. I don't know. I mean, yeah, but what yeah, do the you... thing that bothers me is we have, you know, lots of analogs of the basic EKR and different proofs of the EKR, but the only proof I know of Hilton Milner is Hilton Milner's proof. Yeah. yeah. But what do you mean by an eigenvalue proof exactly? Because many of the stability results use the spectrum in some extent. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Structure, so it's it use a little bit of the spectrum and it uses that most of your characteristic vector will be in your smallest eigenvalue eigenspace. So yeah. Uh, I think any proof that using the algebra and some like about information would be interesting. It may not be exactly what Sebi's asking for, yeah. but it would be a good step on the way. Yeah, but for example, I mean, I think Nathan is not here or so, but for example, um, David Ellis's proof for his quasi-stability result for the symmetric group 
uses a variation of the ratio bound and the spectrum to say something about the second largest example. So it's kind of the, the same okay. thing. But 